This is material for the lecture exam 2, S2P2, section 2, part 2, communication and homeostasis. The best estimate of how many cells within the human body is about 75 trillion. Okay, that's trillion with a T. Right? And in order for the human body to operate Optimally, these cells must effectively communicate with each other and coordinate function to maintain homeostasis, but also to have other normal body functions proceed. So there's three basic methods of communication. We'll go into a little detail on each one uh, in a sec, but we'll just introduce them here. The first is direct cytoplasmic transfer. That's when cells have direct communication between them, usually uh, via what they call gap junctions, or some books are now calling them connexons, so little proton, protein channels that allow information to be passed directly from cell to cell. The second way is called local communication. Uh, local communication, uh, local chemicals, sometimes known as autocrines or paracrines, neurotransmitters, or even uh, local electrical signals called graded potentials work basically by diffusion. So they travel a very short period of time and typically decay uh, fairly quickly and don't go very far. The third type would be long distance communication. That could be chemical or electrical. A great example of a long distance chemical signal would be an endocrine cell releasing hormones into the blood, the blood traveling to a different target cell to have an effect, or a action potential and action potential moving down the neuron uh, you know, say from the spinal cord in your back all the way down to your big toe so that would be an electrical signal which really is just chemical anyway if you think about it and we'll talk about that in the next section so let's look at them a little more detail each one of those so the first one is that direct cytoplasmic transfer well where information is directly transferred from one cell to the next. Uh, oftentimes, uh, those are through what we call gap junctions or sometimes known as connexin, you see it here, uh, proteins, uh, where the information literally just travels from one side to the other through that protein channel. It can be small molecules, including ions. Um, they tend to be very selective, just like ion channels, and most of them are regulated uh, by gates. Uh, so. Uh, that's direct cytoplasmic transfer. It occurs in the heart and uh, in the uh, certain parts of the intestines and a few other places, but those are probably the two big ones that you probably should be aware of. The second form is local communication. This really, you know, largely involves diffusion of chemical signals, but you could also add a local electrical signal as well. Uh, so let's look at the chemical ones though uh, here. And so a local chemical signal works by diffusion, by definition. Uh, it will have a receptor. So notice each one of these cells has a receptor. Okay. And there are two types of signals. Sometimes a cell can release a chemical that feeds back and acts on itself. That would be called an autocrine. Auto means self, right? So autocrine acts on itself. If it acts on a nearby cell, that's called a paracrine. So paracrine means close to or nearby. Um, and so by definition, it's a cell different that it affects than the cell that released the chemical. Um, but both of those work by diffusion. They don't travel very long distances. And you know, a good example that might be histamine. Uh, histamine is a uh, autocrine as well as a paracrine. It can act on its neighbors or itself. Uh, another type of local communication can be uh, chemical or electrical. Uh, the chemical signal, uh, another one, is a neurotransmitter. Now by definition a neurotransmitter is released into a synaptic cleft. A synaptic cleft is this very thin uh, area between a neuron and some sort of nerve uh, effector, probably is the best way to say it. This could be another neuron, it could be a muscle cell, it could be a gland, it could be an organ, lots of different things. And so what happens is the 
neurotransmitter is released in the synaptic cleft that travels by diffusion and binds to receptor on the other side to have an action. So that's called a neurotransmitter. You can also have what's called a graded potential. A graded potential is a localized electrical event that decays with time and distance. Um, those are, we'll find out later uh, in this section at the, towards the end, that a graded potential is due to single gated ion channels opening or closing. Um, so uh, this is trying to demonstrate a large graded potential on this side of the cell body. And as it moves through the cell body, uh, the arrows get lighter and lighter and lighter because the signal over here is you know, fairly large at the one end and decays to something smaller and below threshold at the other end. So those are called graded potentials. So the four big local communication uh, methods that we have to worry about, graded potentials, neurotransmitters, paracrines, and autocrines. So the last category would be the long distance communication. And again, there are you know, two major routes. One would be the endocrine system, and those would be chemicals. Now, there are uh, two basic types of chemicals that we worry about long distance, and they're really effectively the, the same thing, except they are a little bit different. Uh, the first idea is what a hormone. So a hormone is released from an endocrine cell or gland, and by definition goes into the blood, travels through the blood, to some distant target cell. And what this is trying to show is that the chemical only affects the cell with a receptor, right? That's our target where we get a response. Cells without receptors are gonna have no response. You could also have a similar chemical called a neurohormone. Now the only difference is a neurohormone is produced by a nerve ending instead of an endocrine cell. It still has to go into the blood and it still travels and affects a different target cell. So its action is similar, but the difference is where it came from. And as an example, um, the uh, uh, posterior pituitary releases neurohormone. So we'll study a hormone called antidiuretic hormone and also oxytocin are two examples of neurohormones that are released into the blood by nerve endings and travel to a distant target cell to have an effect. So that's the endocrine side. The nervous side is the action potential. We're going to spend some time later on, towards, again, towards the end of this section, the nervous section, on the action potential. But the action potential is considered an electrical signal. Um, really, the electricity is just the movement of ions or charged particles. And for our purposes in our body, it's the movement of an ion, charged ion. And so really, it's the movement of chemicals that causes the electrical signal. But the action potential is a great example of one that's long distance. And again, that action potential is generated at the axon hillock. Okay, that's the um, structural name. The functional name is called the trigger zone. And then it travels down the axon to the ending where it causes something to happen, typically release neurotransmitter to a target cell. And you know, some of these can be quite long. Uh, you have, you know, axons, again, in your back that go out into your big toe. And for some people, they might be three feet long. And so that electrical signal, you know, really truly is long distance communication. Uh, this slide just shows kind of the, the difference between what we talked about earlier. Here's an endocrine cell putting uh, hormones into the blood, in fact, a distant target cell. Here's a neuron. So the nerve ending, putting the chemical into the blood and traveling to a different target cell. So one thing to mention now, is probably a good idea to bring this up, is earlier we looked at, here, neurotransmitters. So what's the difference between a neurotransmitter and a neurohormone? Okay. Really, it's location. If it gets released into the blood, it's a neurohormone. If it gets released into a synapse, it's a neurotransmitter. In fact, sometimes neurotransmitters diffuse out of the synapse into the blood, and they go from being a neurotransmitter to a neurohormone. So uh, 
effectively, you know, from a functional standpoint, they work pretty much the same way as normal hormones do. So, you know, this is kind of a nice little summary of, of looking at the, the three types of communication. Um, oftentimes, the types of communication result in other types of communication. So, um, you know, again, as an example, let's go here. Uh, what causes this local um, neurotransmitter to be released usually is a uh, local electrical event that where calcium comes in and provides energy to, to release the neurotransmitter. And what caused the calcium to come in would be an action potential coming down the neuron. And so, you know, action potentials create graded potentials and graded potentials create action potentials. Um, so you can have these things affecting each other uh, so that, you know, maybe this electrical signal, the target cell is in the nervous system, another neuron, and that excites another neuron, or maybe it inhibits another neuron and doesn't allow it to fire. So there are a number of different ways these communication methods, you know, intertwine. Um, and, you know, the heart is a great example of all these different types of methods in, you know, one type of tissue. Um, so the SA node, right, that's the pacemaker of the cell that has its autorhythmic properties that sets the basic heart pattern. And that generates local potential. So that generates electrical signals that are locally sent through the area. Those local potentials cause what's called the cardiac action potential. So the cardiac action potential is a long distance communication pathway, right? So a local potential caused a long distance uh, potential. Um, the cardiac action potential is actually passed between the cells directly from cell to cell in the atria. And the same thing is true in the ventricles, although it doesn't pass directly between the atria and the ventricles typically. Um, so uh, that cell to cell, right, that's that uh, direct cytoplasmic transfer, right? So in our atria with the cells surrounding the SA node, we have direct cytoplasmic transfer of that information. Okay? Uh, in addition, the heart can respond to paracrines and autocrines, such as histamine. And the heart makes hormones and actually responds to hormones. It responds to uh, action potentials, especially from the sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous system. So the heart's a great example of all these types of communications all rolled up into to one, you know, one organ type of tissue. So we have these signals that uh, are communicating information from one cell to another. And in almost every case, and matter of fact, I can't think of a case where this is not true, that information has to cross the cell membrane and get into the cell itself. Um, so, uh, you know, if you're doing direct cytoplasmic transfer, by definition, you're getting into the cell right away. So that's an easy one. But for the other types of communication, it's a little more difficult. So we divide the types of communication into in, in two basic types. We call lipophilic signals and lipophobic signals. So lipo refers to lipid. Philic means loving. On the other one, lipo, lipid, phobic, right? Fearing or hating, some people say. So lipophilic signals... Uh, are soluble in the nuclear membrane, okay? So they are typically made up of things that are small enough and nonpolar enough to pass directly across the cell membrane. So the big example of that would be steroids. And so here's an example right here of a lipophilic signal that one crosses the cell membrane and goes into the receptor in the cytosol. Okay, so that's a cytosolic receptor. Here's the other one, this round one, passes through the cell membrane, passes through the cytoplasm into the nucleus, and then binds to some receptor with the nucleus, in the nucleus. These typically uh, slow, uh, are slower responses, and what they do is they affect changes in gene activity. So they alter protein activity. Um, that's the fast way they do it or they alter gene expression. They increase or decrease the amount of a protein uh, 
to change some sort of function. Uh, not very often, but occasionally they can also have an extracellular receptor, the lipophobic signals, um, which can speed up um, a reaction where the molecule doesn't have to enter the cell. Uh, but most of the extracellular receptor ones uh, that you see are for the lipophobic signals. Okay? So those are the protein or protein-like signals. Um, and that's because they need a receptor on the extracellular surface because they're not permeable in the membrane. And so they need membrane receptors. And what happens is the signal itself is what we call transduced into the cell. It's typically not receptor-mediated endocytosis like we've learned before, where the uh, ligand binds and the whole complex gets moved into the, the cell. What usually happens, the ligand binds, and that causes some sort of cellular response inside. These tend to be very fast response times. Um, often, that signal is amplified many, many times, which helps increase the speed of it. Um, and so the lipophobic uh, signals, the lipophobic chemicals, the ones that can't cross the cell membrane, that are proteins or protein-like, uh, rely on the extracellular ones. So they tend to be faster than the lipophilic ones. Uh, and uh, we're going to spend most of our time looking at those because those are the ones that tend to be a little more interesting physiologically. So before we get into those, let's take a look at the endocrine functions. Now, endocrines uh, are very important in terms of the human body. And those chemicals help to regulate uh, numerous things. And this isn't everything. Uh, but um, this does give you a nice list of, of at least some of the things that the endocrine does. Uh, it serves as an extrinsic regulator to help maintain a homeostasis. So we said way back the first day of class, literally, that the two most important systems for maintaining uh, homeostasis were nervous and endocrine system. So very important in terms of maintaining homeostasis. Growth and development, another important endocrine function. As a matter of fact, we have a hormone that's so important, right? It's called growth hormone. Um, metabolism is controlled by endocrines. Uh, things that really weren't discovered until I was in graduate school, like uh, leptin and ghrelin, uh, hormones that are important for uh, metabolic purposes. Uh, temperature, hunger, thirst are, are controlled in part by hormones. Uh, your emotions certainly have a hormonal effect. Your immune system is affected by hormones. Digestion and hunger or satia satiation, uh, the feeling of not being hungry are important. Uh, blood volume and blood composition are regulated by hormones. We'll look at that later on in the semester to some degree with the kidney. Um, smooth and cardiac muscle regulation are controlled by hormones. And obviously, the endocrine system is very essential in terms of reproductive function. <laughs> so those are many of the important functions what we would see uh, with the endocrine system. Now, <clears throat> we can divide the endocrines up into a couple categories. We've hit a couple of them. Let's kind of define a little more formally, though. So a hormone is a chemical released by a gland or cell into the bloodstream that affects a different target cell. Okay, so to be a hormone, you have to be released by an endocrine gland or cell. A neurohormone, we've already discussed, so neuro, right, neuron, right, nervous system, are chemicals released by a neuron into the bloodstream that affects distant target cells. So the only difference, again, between a hormone and a neurohormone is where it comes from. Gland or cell, it's a hormone. A neuron, it's a neurohormone. Now, I don't like this term because it really is, you know, an oxymoron. It, it doesn't make any sense um, because hormones are usually defined by going into the blood and affecting a distant target cell. So having a local hormone is impossible, right? So I think we should call this local endocrine, but nobody does. So we'll go with the terminology that everybody uses, a local hormone. Local hormones work by diffusion, don't go into the blood, right? And so they affect nearby cells. That would be autocrines and paracrines we mentioned earlier. And then you have this last kind of list of candidate, 
cannabinoid hormones. And those are chemicals not universally recognized as hormones, but have some attributes of them. Uh, probably the most well-known one would be melatonin. And depending on who you talk to, uh, some people would argue it's a hormone, other people would argue it's not. Uh, so those are candidate hormones. I'm not going to worry too much about candidate hormones. So let's talk a little about the hormone effects. Now, uh, there's a couple hormone effects that we've sort of used before, or the term we've used before, so this should be pretty familiar to you. Um, the first hormone effect is called antagonistic. An antagonistic hormone um, is when one uh, opposes the action of the other. Okay? And this isn't going to name the hormone, all right? Um, but, uh, you know, we're going to kind of just look to see. So let's say we have uh, hormone A. The job of hormone A is to decrease the level of ions or salt or water or glucose in the body. And then we also have hormone B, and its job is to increase the level of ions or salt or glucose or water in the body. And so they had to have opposite actions, so they're antagonistic, right? Insulin and glucagon are a great example of that with blood glucose, right? We also talked about parathyroid hormone and calcitonin earlier this semester as well. So that's the antagonistic effect. Permissive effect is a little confusing. Permissive, think of permission. And permissive effect requires previous or simultaneous action for another hormone. And so a great example of permissive effect is kind of shown here. If you have thyroid hormone, it doesn't affect the fatty acid release by itself at all. If you have the hormone epinephrine, which is also known as adrenaline, right? And by itself, it releases a small amount of fatty acids. But when you have epinephrine and the thyroid hormone together, the epinephrine gives thyroid hormone permission to act, basically, and we get a large amount of fatty acids released. So that is the permissive effect. So the last one, which is sort of like permissive, and I don't like this graph, is synergistic. And the synergistic effect means the combination of two or more hormones is greater than the sum of the individual hormones themselves. All right? So it's not summation. Summation would be if you had hormone A and it gave this effect, and you had hormone B and it gave this effect, and together A and B would give you twice the effect. But synergism shows... Oops, sorry, not the wrong way. Um, that we have hormone A that gives this effect, hormone B that gives a little bit of an effect. So it's similar to uh, permissive effect, but together hormone A and B give you a much, much bigger response. So that's the synergistic effect. Um, the sum of two parts is much greater than the individual parts. We can divide hormones up into two general types and characteristics. Um, one type are what we call the protein or protein-like ones. That includes proteins, peptides, or what they call biogenic amines. So examples of those would be insulin, and then the biogenic amines would be epinephrine. Uh, they tend to be water-soluble, which means they dissolve in the blood. They're polar because they're made up of proteins. Um, because they dissolve in blood themselves, they don't need a carrier. And because they're polar, they can't get into the cell, so they need an extracellular receptor. So their receptor locations tend to be extracellular. In addition, as we mentioned earlier, we could say these tend to be very fast acting because they cause something to happen inside the cell. The other type are your lipophilic ones, right? Those are steroids like estrogen or testosterone. And then your basic amines like thyroid hormones. Those tend to be lipid soluble. And because they're lipid soluble, they tend to be nonpolar. So these can cross the cell membranes directly. Because of their nonpolarity, they need a protein to be attached with them to carry them in the blood. You already know this in some instances probably, but you haven't really thought about it too much. So as an exam, this is true of not just steroid hormones or amines, but any uh, nonpolar substance in the blood. Uh, 
So as an example, let's go with one you probably know, um, LDL. So LDL is a form of cholesterol. It stands for low density lipoprotein. So the last L stands for lipoprotein. And it has to have that lipoprotein to be able to dissolve in the blood and be carried by it. If you didn't have proteins attached to these lipids, uh, they would become insoluble in the blood and they could stop blood flow and in the right place or wrong place, cause serious damage or even death. Because the lipid-soluble nonpolar steroid or amine-like hormones are soluble in the cell membrane, uh, they have typically intracellular receptors. Again, they could be in the cytosol, the cytosolic, or they could be in the nucleus, the nuclear membrane. And they usually have what we call genomic function. Um, they affect how a protein is made or how a protein acts. So here's an example of the extracellular and intracellular um, receptors. So here's my ligand, my hormone, the little green triangle here. And this is not soluble in the plasma membrane, so it attaches to a receptor. Um, the receptor usually activates something inside, which causes something else to activ activate, which then causes some sort of action. Okay, so those are extracellular receptors. The intracellular receptors, we said, can be cytosolic. The receptor would be these little green circles. And the little red dots, right, they're diffusing across the cell membrane into the cell and binding to the receptors or going actually through the nuclear membrane and binding to the receptors inside there. So it could be nuclear or cytosolic receptors there. And again, these tend to be much, much slower. The intracellular ones are slower. The extracellular ones are much faster. Now, when we're talking about uh, receptor mediated reactions the first messenger is the actual signal molecule so the first messenger would be the hormone okay and then for the hormones that use extracellular receptors right you have a protein receptor right and what happens with that protein receptor that protein receptor typically activates intracellular molecules. And those intracellular signal molecules um, we call second messengers. Okay? The first messenger actually does not have to be the, the signal molecule. It could be the signal itself, like an action potential. So it could be an electrical signal, or it could be a, a hormone or a neurohormone. So the second messengers then um, are intracellular molecules that become activated inside, typically one first messenger activates many second messengers, and then those tend to alter target proteins, and that creates a response. Uh, some examples of second messengers, there's many, um, would be calcium. Matter of fact, calcium is the most common second messenger in the human body. So as an example, when an action potential comes and causes the uh, calcium be released from the action potential and the calcium diffuses into the uh, membrane cell of the muscle, uh, it causes contraction, right? So that's really common, but we have other uses for calcium as second messenger. Uh, sometimes they're nucleotides. Um, so one nucleotide is called cyclic AMP. That's what that little C in front of it stands for. It just means the phosphate's attached to two places, but it's still, instead of you know, try or die, it's monophosphate. This is not used for energy, but it is used for signaling. Um, you have um, lipid-derived molecules, like called IP3 for short, that's inositol, inositol phosphate. Um, and then also gases can be second messengers, like NO, that's nitric oxide. Okay, so uh, that's another type of second messenger. So when we look at second messengers, we can kind of see what happens. We have the number one, that's my first messenger, binds to the R, that's my receptor. Number two, right, is my second messenger. 
All right, and that second messenger gets activated and causes some sort of cellular response. So pretty simple. We're not going to worry too much about the details there. Of the second messengers, there's a number of common types of second messengers. Um, DAG or diacetylglycerol, um, and then the phospho uh, uh, inositols, right? We mentioned cyclic AMP, cyclic GMP is similar. Uh, calcium, right, is uh, one we mentioned, and then gases, you know, nitric oxide, carbon monoxide, things like that. So, you know, we have, you don't have to memorize all these, but uh, these are common uh, types of second messengers we will see in a cell. The last idea is signal amplification. And basically the idea is one first messenger ends up activating many, many second messengers. And so it's called sometimes amplification or amplification cascade, we often end up with many, many responses uh, from that one first messenger. And this one's a nice one, you know, kind of shows the idea um, where a ligand binds to the receptor, right, on the extracellular surface, that causes something, an en enzyme in the inside, right, an amplifier enzyme to become excited, and that excites two second messengers, and that excites two different second messengers and or three you know three different second messengers and then those excite a couple second messengers each and so we go from one first messenger to many many second messengers being activated very quickly so that's the amplifier enzyme or amplification good chance to remind you that we want to uh, look at uh, a couple things about um, these uh, receptors, and we've kind of looked at them before, and they'll come up again and again. Um, receptors exhibit three things, three characteristics, specificity, competition, saturation. Again, as a quick review, specificity tells us that receptors have specific three-dimensional structure, and the ligands that will bind only have the complementary structure. Uh, competition, receptors, um, ligands compete for binding sites on a receptor. The competition depends largely on two things, the concentration. The higher the concentration of a ligand, the better it's going to compete. And then affinity, that's the attraction of the ligand for the binding site. The higher the affinity, the better a ligand will compete. And then saturation. We said as we increase the number of uh, receptors that become active, uh, we'll increase the speed of the reaction until all of them are uh, active and we've reached the point of saturation. So those are the three characteristics involved with receptors. So uh, specificity, right, gives us selectivity that only the triangle, I guess a triangle diamond, would fit into the receptor site. I guess a triangle would as well. So it has to have that right three-dimensional structure, but a circle would not. All right. Um, so that brings us to kind of a, a new term, uh, and that's the word agonist. So take a close look at this term, because you're going to see a similar one in a minute, and don't confuse the two. Um, an agonist mimics the ligand. It gives us the same response or activates the pathway. So as an example, later on um, in this very, towards the very end of this uh, section of the nervous system when we get to it, uh, we're going to talk about adrenergic receptors. Now, ad adrenergic receptors respond to things like adrenaline. That's where it gets its name from. And Every adrenergic receptor that we have studied in the human body, right, will respond to adrenaline, okay? Uh, adrenaline also is known as epinephrine, depending on whether you're talking about scientific or what part of the world you're in. And so it has the right three-dimensional structure and it excites the adrenergic receptor. Every adrenergic receptor we've ever studied not only binds adrenaline, but it also binds a close relative called noradrenaline. 
So this is an agonist as well. It activates the receptor. So if we said, okay, what are the agonists for adrenergic receptors? You would say epinephrine and norepinephrine, as both would cause some sort of response. Now, competition comes in when we have similar ligands competing for binding sites. And so when we have uh, our epinephrine and norepinephrine competing for the binding site, again, the concentration, higher concentration, better competes, and then the affinity, which has to do with the three-dimensional shape, the higher the attraction it is, the better it fits. But you can also have a chemical called an antagonist. Okay, we've seen that word before, right, when we had antagonistic effect for hormones. In this case, antagonist means it blocks receptor activity. So an antagonist will block the receptor and not allow the activity to continue. Okay? And so it inhibits the pathway. It makes sure we have no response. Many of our prescription drugs are antagonists for something. They just prevent a pathway from happening. Um, and that gives us the desired effect physiologically, or at least hopefully it does. So remember antagonist. Don't confuse it with agonist. They look very similar. Stop and read. Make sure you understand which one. In terms of saturation, we have an effect um, that we're going to look at called downregulation. And it depends on the type of receptor it is. but you know, generally when a cell has a receptor, it doesn't just have one or two, it has hundreds. Um, and so a typical uh, receptor number on a cell, depending on what cell and what type of receptor it is, it could be anywhere from 500 to 100,000 receptors per cell. Okay, so we can get a lot. Um, and sometimes we want to be able to control the response uh, as well as we can. And in that case, we could do something called downregulation. Downregulation is a decrease, see the error going down, in the receptor number and or sensitivity um, in response to a high level of ligand. So it's a desensitizing agent that desensitizes the pathway. Um, I think most of you are probably familiar with drug resistance, right? So if someone were taking a drug, whether it was prescription or recreational, and took it for an extended period of time, they wouldn't get the same physiological effect towards the end of that time than the beginning of that time, and that's because of downregulation. And basically, your body is trying to mediate, a teleological statement, it'll make sense, uh, mediate the response back to normal. So if you've got a lot of ligand and you're overstimulating the pathway, the normal, then what your body does in response to that is it makes less receptors, down regulation, or they become less sensitive, or they don't bind as easily. And so that has less of a signal and gets more back to the homeostatic normal. Not surprisingly, if you have down regulation, you can have the opposite, and that's up regulation. In upregulation, you get an increase in the number and or sensitivity of the receptors. And that's usually in response to a diminished signal, a signal that's less than normal. And that actually sensitizes the pathway. So, you know, it helps to synthesize, uh, sensitize the pathway and make it more uh, sensitive in terms of, of that. So that's upregulation, downregulation, uh, and to help control the responses. So as kind of a rundown, our signal response is mediated by a number of things. Agonists mimic the signal, activate the pathway. Antagonists block the signal, inhibit the pathway. Downregulation decreases receptor number um, or sensitivity that desensitizes a pathway. And upregulation increases the receptor number of sensitivity, and that sensitizes the pathway. And those are all the result of receptor specificity, competition, and saturation. Now, one of the things that's often overlooked, but again, uh, is helpful to know, and we take advantage of this pharmacologically uh, oftentimes, is how do we 
turn off a signal? How do we make a signal stop? Because we typically don't want signals going on forever. We want to be able to stop it. So common ways to stop a signal. One, diffusion the molecule away. So the molecule just diffuses away. That's it. So if it diffuses away from the receptor, it's not going to bind because it's physically too far. Sometimes we actively transport molecules away. So um, when we want skeletal muscle to relax, we actively pump calcium back into the storage sacs, right? So we just pump it away, spend energy to do it, but we can get away quickly and it gives us control. Uh, sometimes we can degrade the signal. All right, so uh, we can use enzymes as an example um, to uh, degrade the signal. And so we can, you know, there's a enzyme in our skeletal muscle cells called the synapse uh, called acetylcholine esterase. And its job is to break apart acetylcholine so it doesn't keep having the muscle contract, basically. Um, so we degrade the signal enzymatically. Uh, we can remove the signal. So there are ways to remove it, and that actually is degrading it or pumping it or diffusing it away. Um, uh, or um, you can do it through receptor-mediated endocytosis, where we can just take the whole thing in to the cell. It doesn't happen very often, but you can do that. And then finally, you can remove the receptor through a variety of methods, but you know, one of the major ones would be downregulation or take the receptor complex inside through receptor-mediated endocytosis. So all of those would help us to terminate the signal. All right, so this is probably a good point to stop, and we'll, we'll pick up with the next video.